Welcome to Family Bible Time. We're in Jeremiah 39. We're in Psalm 13 and 14. 13 and 14. 14 is the famous one. 13 is actually really a blessing. I think that'll be a blessing for us today. Let's pray and let's go. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you again um, for giving us truth. Thank you for the fact that it is sharper than any two-edged sword and that it deals with us. Lord, please do deal with us. Please shape and fashion us in your likeness. Lord, deal with the things which are wrong in us and strengthen that which is right. Lord, please give us courage in an age where truth is disregarded and even hated. Lord, we pray that you'd give us conviction about what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false. And we pray that you'd also give us comfort. Lord, show us that Show us your ability to keep hold of us, even through terrible times. Thank you for this comfort that we are getting through Jeremiah, through the Psalms. Uh, please reinforce it for us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, uh-oh, this is, this is the year. This is the year of all bad years in the history of Jerusalem, apart from one that's still to come. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate. Nergal Sariza, <laughs> Samgar Nebu, Sarsakim, the Rabsaris, Nergal Sariza, the Rab Mag, with all the rest of the officers of the king of Babylon. They had some great names, didn't they? <laughs> when Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, I guess, okay, the breach was made and they came in, but they probably had inner defences, didn't they? Mm. That was the way, if a city was under siege and you knew the outer wall was going to be breached, maybe you, you shored up the inner defences. And Anyway, I'm guessing they looked from their inner defences. It wasn't an immediate takeover of the whole city. But there they are, they're looking at their enemies and the, they're looking at the commanders and the commanders are now just sitting in the gate. So they're basically saying, here we are, we've come. Mm -hmm. We are. We're going to take over this city. Well, when Zedekiah, the king of Judah and all the soldiers saw them, they fled going out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls. And they went toward the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Ribla in the land of Hamath. And he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Ribla before his eyes. And the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. The Chaldeans burned the king's house. And, all the ha and the house of the people, and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Now, by the way, this is the same time, I know it's recorded, not here, but it's recorded in chapter 52, this is the same time that the king of Babylon burned the temple. 
And as you know, Jeremiah is out of order. For the next bit of Jeremiah, there's going to be lots of stuff. There's going to be some history for us of what happens next. But then there's going to be lots of judgment upon this country and judgment upon that country. And he's going to have these oracles that I don't know. I can't remember when he had them, but he um, he tells all the oracles around about the surrounding nations. And then when you finally get to chapter fifty-two, it's the fall of Jerusalem is retold, mm -hmm. and that includes the story of the temple being burned. But it's talking about Zedekiah, and it's so so. It's it's just you've got to realize. I mean, I I went and read chapter fifty-two today. Maybe you'll want to do the same. But it kind of completes the story at that point, um, and tells about how they also burned burned the temple but also all the great buildings. So basically, um, yeah, they're, they're burning the place down, and breaking down the walls of Jerusalem. Really scary moment. I think of Zedekiah having his eyes put out, whether they used like a hot poker or whether they just used a sharp instrument it doesn't bear thinking about, does it? But the very last <laughs> thing he saw, sorry for that, the very last thing he saw was his own sons being killed and all the nobles in of the city of Jerusalem, all those people that had been against Jeremiah, who had, who had denied the Lord, who had refused to obey the Lord, all those people finally being slaughtered in front of him and then his eyes put out. Wow. Um, I can't remember where I got to. Verse, anyway, nine. verse 9. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city. Those who had, those who had deserted to him and the people who remained. Now, you remember that there were those people that would have believed Jeremiah when God was saying to Jeremiah, you'll keep your life if you go out to the Babylonians. And there were people who'd done that. And so they were being taken off to Babylon to join Daniel and the others. Interesting, isn't it? Um... Verse 10, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because what was one of the sins that Jeremiah and Isaiah before were accusing the nobles of? Well, they were enslaving their own brothers, weren't they? And they were not letting them go. That was one of the wickednesses, but they were oppressing the poor. Isn't it interesting that in God's timing, when he judges the people for their sin, the poor people suddenly are given vineyards <laughs> and are left behind in the land. He's not, Nebuchadnezzar's not coming along to kill all the poor people. That's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's, because he could have just said, let's just wipe out this whole nation at this point. Let's just eradicate every Jew. But he didn't. And you see God's hand, but also God's, God's justice at this very moment. In the moment when God is executing justice on the oppressors, he's also giving justice to the poor. Mm -hmm. And the poor get some vineyards and they get left behind to live. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I like that. Verse 11, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. What? So now Jeremiah's being treated well. Mm -hmm. You think, well, how did they know who Jeremiah was? When I used to picture this, I kind of pictured... In comes the army, and they're just fighting and killing everyone, and it's chaos. And you think, well, how did they? 
maybe it's not so much chaos. Maybe there's a lot more surrender going on than there is fighting. But also, I'm guessing the people who had believed the Lord and gone out and gone over to the Babylonians, um, the people called deserters, well, I'm guessing they had told the Babylonians about this weird prophet called Jeremiah who, said, who, who told them that God said that they had to surrender to the Babylonians. And God said if they surrendered, they'd survive. And God said if they stayed in the city, they'd die. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So they probably knew about Jeremiah. And then they told, they told them to take care of him. So, verse 13, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, the rapturous, Nergal Soriza, the rab mag, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. That's where he was being kept under guard. They entrusted him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, he had a brother called a low cam, of course, um, son of Shaphan, so that he should take him home. So he lived among the people. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. So this is before this now. Um, go and say to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. Hooray! God doesn't forget the Ethiopian eunuch who has trusted in him. Ebed Melech, he went to the king and said, they've done wrong to Jeremiah. And he went and pulled Jeremiah out of the pit. And God hasn't forgotten him. And in the middle of all the chaos, in the middle of all the killing, God sends a message to Ebed Melech and says, you're going to be all right. Isn't that nice? Because I mean, he didn't have to say it. He's, I mean, God could have just done it. But no, he wants Ebed Malek to know that his faith is noticed. Mm. Isn't that great? Because your faith is also noticed. God sees it when you trust him. God sees it when you have a decision to make. And, you, and you're like, oh, but I'm afraid of... Ebed Malek was afraid of certain people. I don't know who they were, but presumably the Jews who if, you know, I mean, if he was trusting the Lord and believing Jeremiah, he was on the side of that traitor Jeremiah and he was taking care of Jeremiah, well, he could have ended up in the pit himself. Mm. He could have ended up being killed by people who hated him, who hated Jeremiah, who hated the Lord. Yeah, so ebed Melech is doing it, but he's doing it kind of, oh, I'm scared. Mm. Well, that's how we have to trust the Lord sometimes, when you're scared. But you just say, it's, I believe the Lord. And I'm going to do what's right. And the Lord says, I see, I see, I see your faith. And it's so good, isn't it, to know that the Lord knows how and determines to take care of you at that point. Mm. Praise the Lord. All right. So, Psalm 13. <sighs> what does it feel like when your enemies seem to be winning? What does it feel like? Let's say 
you're David, King David. But you're not king yet. And Saul is still the king. And he's wicked. And he doesn't trust the Lord. And you trust the Lord. But you're having to run for your life. What's going on? I got anointed king. It was Samuel did it. I didn't say, please anoint me king. He just turned up, poured oil on my head. I was just a shepherd. And he said, I'm going to be king. And and now, and then I got had, went and killed Goliath. And I trusted the Lord. And it all was going well for me. And I was the favorite person. And I was leading the armies. And they were saying, Saul has killed his thousands, but David's killed his tens of thousands. I didn't make them sing that. But now look. Now Saul's trying to kill me. He keeps throwing a spear at me. Now I'm having to run through the wilderness, chased around by Saul's armies. And I just, it's just hard, Lord. What's going on? How would you feel? Okay, what might you be afraid of when things are going badly for you? All right, Psalm 13, to the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel with my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Now, what's David's fear? What's, what's your fear when things are going badly for you, when your enemies are exalted over you, when they seem to be having the victory? You know, they're in power. They have, they have things going their way. And you're, you're like David, you just feel like things are not going your way. How, what might you be afraid of? Has God forgotten me? Is God, is God just not watching? What's happened? That's your fear, isn't it? Secretly, you might fear that God seems to have forgotten you, hiding his face from you. I mean, have you offended God? It's Let's say you're ill and you can't understand it. And you're like, Am I, have, I been, have I done something wrong? Am I being disciplined? How long? What's going on? How long must I have sorrow in my heart all the day? You're just down in the dumps. You just feel like, oh, this is horrible. I just don't feel right. I'm not, I'm not happy. How long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long are things going to go badly for me like this? And wicked people are going to get their way. All right, that's your fear, isn't it? That you're forgotten and your experiences, you're sad. And maybe you think God is disciplining you or hiding his face from you at least. It doesn't seem like you can... Come near to God. By the way, this is the experience of almost every Christian at some point. I've, I, I actually don't think I've met a Christian who's been a Christian for any great length of time who hasn't at some point experienced this. Spurgeon experienced it, um, it in, in, a, in a great way. But it's just there as the experience of Christians. They end up just feeling like, well, what's wrong, God? And now the prayer that you pray when that's going on is what? Oh, how long? <laughs> it's kind of your, oh, Lord, when's this going to stop? Hmm. How long, how long, how long, how long? Now verse 3, here, here's where the prayer continues. Consider me. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. So this is the prayer, isn't it? This is like David saying, God, if you don't help me, come on, please, consider me. Light up my eyes, give me some joy. Do something for me, God. 
if you don't, hang on a minute. God, if you don't help me, my enemy is going to say, I've got, I've, I've won. Well, that wouldn't be good for God because you're his child, right? It's not good for God if his children are defeated by the enemy and the enemies rejoice, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. That, that actually reflects upon God because God is our protector and defender. What time is it? Ten to. Okay, that's fine. Now, all of that is really quite, it's like, oh, David's struggling. But now in verse 5, look at this. Verse 5 starts with the word, but. Hmm. This is a, um, in Hebrew, it's arranged, it separates this from everything that's gone before. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. All right, this is so good. This is David. Okay, we've got his fear. We've got his prayer. And now we've got his faith. And when you're going through times like this, you've got your fears and you've got the circumstances you're in and the way you feel and it's all very scary and you've got sorrow in your heart and, um, you know, you're worried that your enemies are going to exult over you and rejoice because you're shaken. And then you've got your prayer and you're crying out to God. How long, how long, how long? Lord, consider, Lord, lift up my face. Lift up my eyes. Don't let my enemy say this. That would be bad for you, Lord. But now you've got your faith. And this is David's faith. And he says he's kind of turning from all his fears and his experience. And he's coming out of his prayers and he's saying, I've trusted. So here's a question. Have you trusted? Trusted what? Have you trusted in God's steadfast love? I have trusted in your steadfast love. Chesed. Have I ever told you about the word chesed? <laughs> <laughs> Only a hundred times, right? Chesed, is that just wonderful thing? What is it? All right. Translated steadfast love, sometimes loyal love. The idea is God's committed covenant love he is decided he has sworn i will love this person well that's what he said to david he's committed his love to david and he's committed his love to everyone who is in the son of david jesus so his his covenant love is, is like his determined love to save his determined love to bless he's He's absolutely 100% determined, I'm going to save this individual. I'm taking them to heaven. I'm blessing them. There's nothing going to change that. That's my decision. I've sworn by myself, says God. You know, I'm just, I'm doing this to this person. It's election. It's like you, you're saved, you're loved. Why? Well, I, don't, I don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Loving kindness. It's God's mercy and love all in one package chesed wonderful and you just so what is what is david trusting in so everything feels bad everything he's sad he's worried his enemies are rejoicing over him his enemies are triumphing over him they just seem to be getting the upper hand maybe he's just you know saul's chasing him around he's like god how long is this going to go on for and then he says, I've prayed to you. I've trusted in your steadfast love. I've trusted that you're committed. You've sworn stuff to me. So I'm trusting in that. So look, can I just ask you, are you trusting in that? Are you, today, okay, how do you feel? You can feel terrible, can't you? 
What are you praying about? Well, you should be praying how long? Okay, that's fine. But you need to move from that to this, this, don't you? I've trusted. You need to be able to say, God has sworn. God has promised. How do you know that? Well, look, if you're trusting in Jesus, you know it because he, he sent his only son to the cross to die for you. Mm-hmm. Is he going to send his son to the cross to die for you? And then let the enemy just destroy you and that's it? No. I mean, look, he took care of Ebed Melech. He saw his faith. He, he cares about those who trust in him. He took care of the poor. He took care of the people who went over to the Babylonians and believed in him, despite everything, despite people saying, deserters, deserters. No, he did, took care of them. They, he gave them their lives, as he promised. And God knows how to take care of us, doesn't he? He take, knows how to take care of you. And so is that what you're trusting in? Are you trusting in, oh God, you, you can take care of me. I've trusted in your steadfast love, says David. And then look what he says. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. My heart shall rejoice. It's like, I will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. Hang on a minute, a moment ago you were saying, well, how long will you hide your face from me? Will you forget me forever? Well, that's how David felt. That's what David could see. But now he's not going by what he can see. He's going by faith. He's walking by faith and not by sight. That's what you need to do. All right. Then you can rejoice. Chapter 14, Psalm 14, to the choir master, seems they had a choir master, of David. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now the fool says it in his heart, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He really, he inwardly, he kind of says to himself, there's no God. It made me think of Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, but by their works they deny him. So there, there, there are people who even say that they know they believe in God. But actually, you can see that they're fools. Because by what they do, they deny it. They show that they, they inwardly deny him. And this is the fool. He says in his heart, there's no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none that does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. You think of Zedekiah. So tragic, isn't it? Think of all those nobles. So tragic. Have they no knowledge? Verse 5. There they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Isn't that so appropriate? Yeah, there's nobles. There they are. They're just saying, where is God? There is no God. And they're corrupt. They, 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 they'll, make a, they'll make a covenant when the Babylonians are at the gates. And then when the Babylonians withdraw, they break their covenant. And they take their slaves back. And they oppress the poor and the needy. And they say there is no God in their hearts. They comfort themselves. There's no God. And now here they are, verse 5, in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. They, verse 6, would shame the plans of the poor. But the Lord is his refuge. The Lord takes care of Ebed-Melech and Jeremiah. And the poor in the city and the poor in the land. The Lord takes care of them. 
even by the hand of the, of the Babylonians. The Lord is his refuge. Isn't that good? Mm-hmm. Verse 7. So what, what's happening at the moment? So David's kind of seeing all of this. Uh, this is like a reflection by David on the way God deals with the, the fool and the oppressor and the corrupt people and so on. And, and, and what's his longing for Israel? What's his longing for his land, for his people? Verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. And that's what David's longing for, even right back then. Now, you can understand, can't you, the longing of God's people, that he would restore Israel, that he would restore the fortunes of his people and and then they would rejoice in him. Lord, we pray that you would do that. We pray that you would hear the prayer of David and hear our prayer now that you would restore the fortunes of Israel. Um, Lord, that you would bring about the fulfillment of all the prophecies that you've made to bless your people Israel, to bless the children of Abraham, to bring them to the salvation that you've promised them, the steadfast love that you promised to David, that that you promised to Abraham, that is sure and certain and that you cannot change. Otherwise, you break your own promises, Lord. Please save the Jews. Restore them, Lord, we pray. We pray for ourselves and we pray for the people of God now, Jew and Gentile gathered into churches, We pray, Lord, that you would also be merciful to us. Where your people are trusting in you, strengthen them, Lord, protect them. Give them joy like David to be able to move from our fears to faith and to walk by faith and not by sight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. We will see you, God willing tomorrow for another family Bible time. It's lovely being in Psalms, isn't it? See you tomorrow.